that he is, of course, the winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics. But what I would like to emphasize for our audience is that he is also has achieved or won the prize for the humanist of the year. Uh, this means that Steve is able to uh, make intelligible science to a general uh, audience. Uh, he does this in a number of ways, and not least is the number of societies and groups uh, and so on that Steve and Louise uh, belong to. Uh, I remember one in particular that I used to attend on a regular basis. I believe it was called the Menza Society. Uh, no? <laughs> Maybe it was ironic use of the... Uh, no, no, no. It's called the Tuesday Club. No, no, it wasn't the Tuesday Club. It was one of the other, so many that, that, that Steve has forgotten one of the uh, societies that he once sponsored. But I remember distinctly the, uh, the reason uh, that I stopped going. There was a session on why people laugh at dirty jokes. <laughs> Got to the end of the hour, and it suddenly dawned on me that no one had yet told a dirty joke. <laughs> that was my end of the association with this particular group. Uh, Steve Weinberg on Isaac Newton. to a climax with the uh, great work of Isaac Newton. Uh, this led the Cambridge historian Herbert Butterfield, who normally didn't write about the history of science, to say that the scientific revolution outshines everything since the rise of Christianity and reduces the Renaissance and Reformation to the rank of mere episodes, mere internal displacements, within the system of medieval Christendom. Well, you know, any time professional historians sense that a consensus is building of that sort, uh, they immediately see the opportunity for progress in their own careers by attacking it. <laughs> uh, and uh, the idea of a scientific revolution has indeed been widely attacked. Uh, one strain of attack is that, uh, which is much loved by Arabists and medievalists, <coughs> is that everything that was important had already been done in the Middle Ages. That's hard to defend. Uh, another strain, which is closer to what I'm talking about today, was that the great figures of the, of the supposed scientific revolution, from Copernicus, Galileo, uh, through Huygens, Newton, uh, were really not modern scientists. They were much closer to the spirit of the Middle Ages. And um, as an example, there is the well-known remark of Lord Keynes that Newton was not the first of the age of reason. He was the last magician, which is quoted in the poster of this talk. Um, there is a lot of truth in that. Uh, Copernicus and Kepler, uh, when you read what they have to say about the solar system, often sound as goofy as Plato. Uh, Galileo uh, regularly cast horoscopes, even when no one was paying for them. <laughs> uh, but Newton, perhaps, is the poster boy for the survival of the ancient and medieval worlds into the period that's supposed to be the scientific revolution. There's a, the, his papers, which had been held in a private collection, were put on sale at an auction in Sotheby's in 1936. And someone calculated that of, in these private papers of Newton, 
There were more than a half a million words on alchemy and more than twice that many on religion. So clearly he had concerns that uh, we would not today regard as part of normal science. He was altogether uh, an odd bird, uh, very odd at the place of a crucial role in the history of science. Uh, he never traveled except for a limited strip of England between his birthplace in Lincolnshire and the University of Cambridge and London. Uh, he never even got to see the sea, uh, although he was so much interested in its tides. All he knew about the tides is what he read. Um, he apparently had no close uh, relations with any woman, including his mother. And uh, after his death, uh, Voltaire reported that he had conversations uh, with Newton's doctors who told him uh, that it was clear to them that Newton had never been intimate with a woman. Although, I don't quite see how they could have told that. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, there is no record, there's no historical record of Newton ever uh, having a close relationship with any woman. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about his life uh, up to a certain point where I, I think I'll break off and say a little bit about his work. Um, he was born in 1642, uh, the year Galileo died, which suggests some sort of conservation law. Uh, he was uh, born to uh, Posthumously, his father was an illiterate yeoman farmer who died shortly before uh, Newton's birth. He was born on Christmas Day, which perhaps gave him ideas. Um, his mother was of a higher social class than his father. Uh, her brother had been to the University of Cambridge and become a clergyman. And they owned their farm, Woolsthorpe Manor. Uh, his when uh, Newton was three, his mother remarried and left Woolsthorpe, uh, leaving Newton in the care of his grandmother. Uh, she returned when Newton was 10 and immediately packed Newton off to a school uh, conveniently far enough away so that Newton couldn't get home too much, the King's School, a one-room school at, at Grantham. Uh, near Woolsthorpe in Lincolnshire, where Newton learned uh, Greek and Latin, of course, um, some arithmetic and geometry, a little Hebrew, a little theology. At any rate, he, he learned enough so that he could qualify for entrance into the University of Cambridge. And after an unsuccessful try at farming uh, on the family farm at Woolsthorpe, he was sent up to to Trinity College, Cambridge, as a sizar, which means that he paid his way by performing various menial duties. In 1665, uh, when Newton was <coughs> 23, uh, the play <coughs> hit Cambridge and shut the university. And Newton went home to Woolsthorpe, uh, but he had already begun serious work on mathematics and physics, which, freed from the distractions of Cambridge, he uh, continued <coughs> intensively at home. And he said later that he, at this point, he minded philosophy, meaning science, more than at any other time in his life. Uh, after the plague was over, Cambridge reopened. Newton, uh, two years later, was made a fellow of Trinity College, which gave him a stipend of two pounds a year and access to the college library. Um, two years after that, um, Isaac Barrow, who was the first professor of mathematics ever at Cambridge, uh, Cambridge had not in the Middle Ages been remotely as distinguished as Oxford in the sciences. Um, Isaac Barrow, uh, 
who held the Lucasian chair, he was the first holder of that chair, decided that he wanted to devote himself full time to theology, and he chose Newton to be his successor. Uh, Newton taught as Lucasian professor, and um, in 1672 joined a new organization that had been formed in London uh, shortly after the Stuart Restoration in 1660, a group that had been uh, that had met informally, including uh, Edmund Halley, um, Christopher Wren, and uh, Hook. What's his name? First name? Robert. Robert Hook. Thank you. Uh, names disappear from me. Um, Robert Hook uh, decided to come together and form uh, an organization which became known as the Royal Society. <coughs> Newton joined the Royal Society in 1672 at the age of 30. Uh, in 1675, he faced a crisis in his life because he had been a fellow of um, Trinity College for eight years. And according to the statutes, I'm not sure whether the statutes of the university or of the college, after eight years, he had to take holy orders in the Church of England in order to hold on to his fellowship. And that required that he had to swear to his belief in various Christian tenets, including the Holy Trinity, which Newton couldn't swear to because he was a Unitarian. He was not orthodox in religion. Um, fortunately, by 1675, he was already well enough known and well enough respected so that the king, uh, Charles II, was induced to make an exception in his case and declare that from then on the Lucasian professorship uh, exempted its holder from the requirement to take holy orders. And Newton, so was his fellowship and his academic career was for say. Well, I've taken Newton up to the age of 33. Uh, he, as I said, he has already become well known as a significant scientist. And I'd like to now tell you a little bit about the work he did. Uh, it falls under three significant categories, optics, mathematics, and his work on motion and gravitation. Optics, the theory of light, uh, he, uh, he wrote about, and the uh, first task was to, mol to demolish the ideas of Descartes, which uh, he did very effectively. But his great work in the theory of light was his understanding of color. Um, he did experiments with prisms, taking white light from the sun and breaking it up into the various colors, which of course had been done since antiquity, everyone knew that when light strikes a curved piece of glass uh, or an oddly shaped piece of glass, anything but a flat piece of glass, uh, the light, you see a variety of colors, all the colors of the rainbow. But he then went on to do more critical experiments. One of them was he took rays of red light or blue light, which he had gotten from breaking up sunlight into the different colors, and put them through a prism to see if additional colors would be added, and, and they weren't. Red light remained red light, blue light remained blue light. He then did an even more impressive experiment, in fact, I, I'm not even entirely sure he did it or whether he just reported it, uh, because it seems very hard to do. He took all the colors of the rainbow that had been separated by one prism, and using a clever arrangement of prisms, put them back together again so that they formed a ray of, what would you think, white light. Uh, he lectured about this in London at the time I've come to, 1675, and was attacked by Robert Hooke, who uh, said that uh, Hooke had done the same experiments and they didn't prove anything. The, the color was clearly added to the light by the glass. And this began a uh, long relationship between Hooke and Newton, one of enmity and uh, bitterness. Um, Cook, by the way, was a very impressive figure, as it, it seems everyone in London was at that time. Cook <laughs> uh, was 
a polymath. I mean, he worked not only on physics, but on astronomy. He was an architect. Uh, he was a city planner. Uh, probably many other things I don't know about. Uh, but like Halley and Christopher Wren, he, and like Newton, he just did lots and lots of, of, of different things that you would never imagine a physicist today doing. Uh, Newton, although he was right about color, was wrong about the nature of light. He thought it was a stream of particles and uh, dismissed various experiments that showed indeed it had a wave nature. There was already an experiment done by a, um, a, pri a priest, Grimaldi, who uh, observed the shadow cast by a very thin, raw, opaque rod. And Grimaldi found that the shadow was not perfectly crisp, but had fringes around its outside, which we today uh, associate with the fact that that thin rod was about had a, had a width comparable to the wavelength of the light. What Grimaldi was seeing was the phenomenon of diffraction. In, in fact, there was a wave theory of light that was extant uh, due to great Dutch scientist Christian Huygens. Huygens succeeded in using the wave theory of light to explain all sorts of things, like the way light is bent on going from one medium like air into another medium like glass or water. <laughs> phenomenon of refraction. And um, uh, Newton just ignored this. This was not Newton at his best. Uh, in mathematics, he began, uh, he had a lifelong fascination with the, uh, the infinite <coughs> and the infinitesimal. Uh, he, dur at Woolsthorpe, during the plague year, his attention turned to questions like, if you have a series, one minus a half, plus a third, minus a quarter, plus a fifth, and so on, I think you've got the pattern, what does it add up to? Well, it's not so obvious what it adds up to. Newton figured it out. It's the logarithm of two. Um, something that uh, was really quite a remarkable result for the time. He developed the calculus of both the differential calculus, which deals with figuring out from a known quantity, like the known position of a particle along the line, how fast it's moving at every instant. That's the differential calculus. And on the other hand, if you know how fast it's moving at any mo moment, how far has it gotten at any time? That's the integral calculus. He worked these things out, but he kept them secret which is not so idiosyncratic. It was an age when scientists very often kept their work in secret, as Galileo did on occasion. Meanwhile, uh, Gottfried Leibniz in Germany uh, was developing the same ideas. Leibniz had the uh, good wit not to keep it secret and try to get as much credit for it as possible. And that began another one of Newton's uh, feuds. Uh, Leibniz published uh, uh, his work on calculus without mentioning Newton, although he knew that Newton had been working on this. Uh, Newton, well then an article appeared, in the anonymous article appeared in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, and um, in uh, claiming that all the credit really belongs to Newton. That article was reviewed uh, in anon an anonymous review in 1715, uh, which came to the same conclusion that really all the credit belongs to Newton. As you might perhaps have already guessed, both the article and the anonymous review were written by Newton. <laughs> Newton was not a nice man. Uh, but his greatest work, the work for which he is, um, his historic reputation, on which his historic reputation works, is his work on motion and on the theory of gravitation. The idea that the planets are held in orbit around the sun and the moons of the planets, uh, they were already known to be moons of Jupiter and of Saturn, 
and of course of the Earth, uh, are held in orbit around their parent planet, uh, the idea that this is due to some force which decreases with the inverse square of the distance was already widely uh, suspected. I shouldn't say known, but I should say suspected. Uh, because it explained one of Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, the one that says that the square of the period, the length of time it takes a planet or a moon to go round in its orbit, is proportional uh, for a given parent body to the cube of the average radius of the orbit. Uh, and not only Newton, but also Halley, Christopher Wren, and Robert Hooke uh, all saw that connection, that if the force goes as the inverse square of the distance, then Kepler's third law, that the square of the period goes as the cube of the radius of the orbit, follows. It, it's actually elementary algebra, but I won't bother you with it. Um, but uh, this left open a big question, because although it's very nice for Kepler's third law, what about his first law? The first the understanding of the third law was based on the idea that the planets and the moons go around on circular orbits. The first law of Kepler was that the orbits are elliptical. And uh, the, ver the distance from the parent body changes with time, and the speed of the planet changes with time. Um, no one, at first, knew how to deal with elliptical orbits. In 1684, Newton received a visit from Halley and uh, Halley told him about the fact that uh, he, Halley, and Christopher Wren, and Newton's dear friend Robert Hooke, had uh, all come to this conclusion that uh, the force must go as the inverse square of the distance. But uh, Halley asked, that's we only understand for circular orbits. What would be the generic orbit of a body acting under the influence of an inverse square law force. What, it could be a circle, but what else could it be? Well, Newton knew the answer, of course, because that had already been provided on the basis of observation by Kepler. Kepler's, by the way, Kepler's laws, of course, were purely phenomenological. That is, they were based on observation. They were not derived from any fundamental theory. Uh, Newton knew the answer would be the orbits have to be ellipses. And he said to Kepler, the orbits have to be ellipses. Uh, I don't know whether in 1684 Newton had actually shown that or not, or whether he was just bluffing, certainly capable of bluffing. But three years later, in 1687, uh, he published his great book called the Principia. I, I won't go through the Latin name. It translates into the mathematical principles of natural philosophy undoubtedly the greatest book ever written in the physical sciences, in which he showed, uh, using not so much calculus, but using his understanding of infinitesimals and infinite series, like that one minus a half plus a third, etc. He showed that indeed, under an inverse square law, the planets and the moons of the planets would behave the way that Kepler had said they do behave, that is, they would travel on uh, ellipses or circles. Comets uh, who go out, come from outer space and go back to outer space would travel on other, these are all called uh, conic sections, they would travel on hyperbolas or perhaps parabolas. And uh, he made sense out of the whole solar system. He did other things. Uh, he tried for a theory of the tides, which, as I said earlier, interested him very much. Uh, and he got it right, where Galileo, by the way, had completely misunderstood what the tides were. He thought the tides were caused by the waters of the ocean sloshing around as the Earth went around the sun. Uh, Newton recognized that the tides were caused by the fact that the gram for gram, the, the moon pulls water that's underneath the moon, that's uh, when right below the moon, 
uh, more, because it's closer to the moon, more than it does the Earth. So the water is pulled away from the Earth. And on the other side of the Earth, the moon's gravity pulls the Earth more strongly than it does the water. So the Earth is pulled away from the water. So you have high tides roughly every 12 hours. The sun complicates that and makes the tides bigger when the sun and the moon are lined up, like when you have a new moon or a full moon. Um, but it was impossible to, for Newton, or anyone else for centuries after, to get a detailed quantitative theory that would tell you how high the tides would be at Ramsgate or the Bay of Fundy on any particular day and time, because it depends on complications like the topography of the ocean bottom. And by the way, this is a common theme in the history of science. Uh, some people talk as if a scientific theory is validated when, it, when its predictions agree with all observations. Well, we're never that lucky. Uh, a scientific theory is validated when its predictions agree with a few observations of phenomena that are simple enough so that we can do the calculations. And planetary motions was such a phenomena, the tides were not. And the fact that Newton's theory had failed to account quantitatively for the tides was really beside the point. It's like saying that our modern theory of strong nuclear forces is incapable of calculating the mass of the proton. I've read an article that made this point, but it's, it's beside the point. Those cal we don't solve every problem. We solve enough problems, and typically easy problems. Tides is a, high, is a hard problem. So I'm being defensive on Newton's behalf about the tides, but on another phenomena, he doesn't come off so well. But that's the precession of the equinoxes. Um, you know, the Earth is slightly oblate because it's spinning, and, gra gra and the centrifugal force pulls it out at the equator. It's, a, it's nearly a sphere, but it's slightly oblate. The gravitational action of the sun and moon on the equatorial bulge causes the axis of the Earth to wobble. This wobble of the axis of the Earth, although it wasn't expressed that way, was first noticed around 150 BC by Hipparchus, the greatest naked eye, well, the greatest observational astronomer of the ancient world. What he observed was that the point in the firmament of fixed stars in which the sun is at the equinoxes, it was gradually changing with time in, at a rate of about, well, actually, we know the correct value now is about 50 seconds per, per year, 50 seconds of arc. That's enough so that the axis, he didn't know about the axis of the Earth, but in modern terms, the axis of the Earth will make one complete turn every 26,000 years. And he got that right, Hipparchos did. He's really quite an impressive character. Um, <coughs> Newton was the first person who understood why that was true, the explanation being what I've already said, and he set out to calculate it. And he got a result for the contribution of the moon, which was about 40% off, because he made a fundamental mistake. And then he calculated the contribution of the sun in a way that's hard to follow, but somehow they added up to what was known <coughs> as the correct observational result. Newton clearly fudged his theoretical calculation to get the right answer. And uh, there are other cases that he fudged. Uh, Robert Westman has pointed out that he also fudged his calculation of the speed of sound. Um, nevertheless, and by the way, uh, Newton's Pacidia made no prediction of anything new. It was all retrodiction, <coughs> explanation of things that were already known observationally, like Kepler's three laws or the precession of the equinoxes. But it didn't matter. The achievement was so great, uh, Newton, I mean, it was, it was really convincing to anyone who was capable of understanding the book. Uh, Newton's Principia was published with an ode by Halley, Edmund Halley, which was quite a compliment. 
Then ye who now on heavenly nectar fare, come celebrate with me in song the name of Newton to the muses dear. For he unlocked the hidden treasuries of truth. So richly through his mind had Phoebus cast the radius of his own divinity. Nearer the gods no mortal may approach. Uh, well, Newton became famous. Uh, now coming back to his life, he was elected. By the way, how long do these talks usually last? <laughs> I do. Well, even so, what's what's today? Oh, okay. Uh, he was elected as an MP from Cambridge twice. He was made uh, warden and later master of the mint in 1694. And we're going to hear about that. I look forward to it from Professor Scott next week. Uh, in 1703, uh, after the death of his old enemy, Robert Hooke, who had been president of the Royal Society, a period in which Newton would never attend the Royal Society, uh, when Hooke died, Newton accepted the presidency, and uh, he was knighted in 1704. He died of a kidney stone in 1727, and was given a state funeral in Westminster Abbey, even though he had refused the sacraments of the Church of England. And uh, Voltaire was present at his funeral and said, uh, the English give their scientists funerals fit for kings. Well, they don't do it too often. <laughs> On the continent, there was much opposition to his work, uh, especially from the followers of René Descartes and Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, uh, because his theory was so different from theirs. and. Some of the criticisms were really quite unfair, like the fact that he had, uh, he was talking about an occult force and action at a distance. Uh, Descartes uh, wanted only to think about forces being pushings and pulling, pullings or pressures um, and imagine the space beyond the orbit of the moon to be filled with uh, some kind of material ether. Uh, but it didn't matter. Uh, the nationalistic prejudices and philosophical preconceptions were all overcome. I mean, this is one of the nice things in working in physics, that you, you get a clear sense of who's right. Um, they were all overcome by the mid-1700s. And in fact, uh, the calculation that Newton had fudged of the procession of the equinoxes caused by the wobbling of the axis of the Earth was correctly done by a Frenchman, d'Alembert, in 1749. And now predictions began to be made and verified. Halley uh, had noticed that there was a comet that had, re that, well, that in roughly 75 year intervals since 1531, a comet was seen in the sky. Halley said this is probably the same comet on an extended elliptical orbit uh, which returns to the neighborhood of the Earth every 75 years. And from observations from 1531 and then 75 years later and 75 years later, he predicted that the comet would return in December 1758. Uh, he didn't live to see it, but uh, unfortunately, but in fact it did return on Christmas, 1758. But, you know, I've described work that would make anyone famous, anyone regarded as a great scientist, but I think I haven't really expressed what was so important about Newton. He achieved two great unifications in human thought. This is much more important than explaining the procession of the equinoxes or Kepler's laws of planetary motion, bringing together modes of thought that had previously been thought to be separate. One, the most obvious, was to unify the celestial and the terrestrial. Uh, Aristotle had made a clear distinction between them. <coughs> the laws that apply in the sublunary, sublunary world are different from the laws that apply in space beyond the orbit of the moon. 
Um, Newton's work on planetary motion didn't eliminate that distinction, but it was Newton who, for the first time, uh, made a connection between the force of gravity as it holds the planets in the orbits and the force of gravity we all exper experience here on the surface of the Earth. And he did that in his work, which began during the plague year when he was at home in Woolsthorpe uh, in his study <coughs> of the moon. What he found was that the moon, roughly speaking, moves in a circular orbit which means it's continually accelerating toward the Earth. No, it's not going to fall, but if it weren't accelerating toward the Earth, it would fly in a straight line off into space. And the amount by which it bends toward the Earth can be expressed as an acceleration, a centripetal acceleration toward the Earth. It was also known, measured by other people, especially Huygens, that bodies falling here on the surface of the Earth fall with an acceleration of 32 feet per second in every second. Newton compared the acceleration of uh, the moon toward the Earth with the acceleration of an apple toward the ground in Lincolnshire and found that the moon, which is 60 times further from the center of the Earth than the apple, uh, accelerates toward the Earth with an acceleration which is less by a factor of 60 squared, or 3,600, because of the inverse square law. And that, for the first time, made a connection between something completely familiar on Earth with the motion of the heavens. The other great unification that Newton achieved uh, may surprise you because I think most people don't realize that there was anything to unify was a unification between physics and mathematics, including astronomy, which was generally regarded as a branch of mathematics. Uh, physics had been the explanation of why things are the way they are uh, in the style of Aristotle, often in terms of a final cause, which is purpose. Uh, it was as most people understood it, and it certainly was true in Aristotle and his, and his followers, it was non-mathematical. Mathematics was something that people needed when they were trying to get phenomena exactly right, but that was not the main purpose of natural science. The main purpose of natural science was to understand causes. For example, a priest, Nicholas Malebranche, wrote a review of the Principia when it came out and said that it was the work of a geometer, not of a physicist. What Malebranche didn't realize, of course, was that Newton had bridged the gap between geometry and physics, had changed the definition of what a physicist should be. Um, there was a, I'll, I'll quote myself, but I'll give a little story about this. There was a, in 16, 87, the Perkinthia came out. In 1987, the University of Cambridge satis, uh, celebrated this, it was the tercentenary, and um, I was invited to give a talk. That's not as impressive as it sounds, because our daughter was spending the year in Cambridge at the Medical Research Center, and uh, I had spent the whole year hinting that I would like to be invited. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I, I gave a talk and I said Newton was the first to show the possibility of an understanding of nature that was both comprehensive and quantitative. This gap between physics, mostly the physics of Aristotle, and mathematics, including its branch, astronomy, had gone way back. There's a, there's a lovely statement of the distinction between physics and astronomy uh, by Geminus of Rhodes in, I don't think I have time to read it. Well, if anyone wants to ask me, I'll read. Um, and uh, you see this, for example, in arguments about the nature of planetary motions, which continued until the time, at least, of Galileo. Um, on one hand, there were the followers of Aristotle, like the Arab Averroes and, and many others, 
who believe with Aristotle that the planets are carried on spheres, all of which have the center of the Earth as their, um, as their center, but are coupled to each other in complicated ways so that you can try to account for the apparent motions of the planets. Uh, on the other hand, there was a theory of Ptolemy, the theory of epicycles and equants and eccentrics. Ptolemy's theory, for reasons which perhaps someday I'll explain, um, actually works very well in accounting for the actual apparent motions of the planets in the heavens. Uh, Aristotle's theory didn't work well at all. But for 2,000 years, uh, a debate had raged. 2,000 years? Well, maybe a little bit less. Um, between the followers of Aristotle and Ptolemy, which was really a, a debate over the nature of science, between physics, in the sense of the physics of Aristotle, and mathematics, in the sense of that was used by astronomy. And it was Newton who ended this schism with a mathematical explanation of why the planets move the way they move. Uh, Newton's theory is of permanent validity. And I'm, I emphasize this because I think Thomas Kuhn has said some very sim silly things about the way that uh, scientific theories only last for a certain period and then are totally replaced by something incommensurate with the early theory. I think that's nonsense. It doesn't fit my experience at all. Uh, but a lot of people think it's true. Uh, and in the same direction, when uh, in 1919, measurements of the bending of light from a distant star passing close to the surface of the sun agreed with Einstein's general theory of relativity, the Times of London said, uh, Newton's theory disproved in their headlines, which is silly. Uh, general relativity did not disprove Newton's theory. It contained it as an approximation. Just as every new theory contained, contained successful early theories as an approximation. Um, this can be put in poetic terms, which I always like. Um, in 1730, uh, oh, what is it? That's about uh, 43 years after the publication of Print the Principia, Alexander Pope uh, wrote an uh, epitaph on Newton, famous few lines, a couple. Of Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. Then in the 20th century, after the work of Einstein became generally well known uh, because of the eclipse expedition in 1919, a satirical poet, J.C. Squire, added another couplet. He said, it did not last. The devil howling, ho, let Einstein be, restored the status quo. <laughs> well, don't believe it. Uh, in fact, uh, the general theory of relativity did not restore some kind of confusion that had apparently been resolved by Newton's theory. And in fact, uh, the intellectual distance between Einstein's general relativity and Newton's theory of motion and gravitation is vastly less than the distance between Newton's theory and anything that had gone before. famous auction at 
other being from 1936. So he had a vested interest in this. He had bought some of the papers. And he became a Newton fan. And uh, uh, he was scheduled to give, since he's British, he better get this, but he was scheduled to give a talk <laughs> about Newton. In, um, and then he died. And the talk was given on using his manuscript by his brother. Uh, and no one had a chance to ascertain uh, exactly what he had meant. Uh, but I think what he meant was that he saw in Newton, first of all, uh, an interest in many things that you wouldn't think a scientist would be interested in, like the half million, well, actually 650,000 words on alchemy and a million 300,000 words on religion in the papers that were on auction in Sotheby's. So it was clear Newton, I mean, Newton had devoted vast amounts of time to the chronology of the Book of Daniel. So he, his mentality was not that of the age of reason. Uh, Newton thought that the solar system was unstable and God had to give it a nudge every once in a while to keep it in being. He also thought that luminous bodies like the uh, sun and stars, which shone, unlike the planets, by their own light, could not be, that luminosity could not be understood except through the action of God. Uh, well, we just think we understand it now in terms of nuclear reactions and the core of the stars. Um, so he was profoundly religious, and uh, that alone would, I think, make it, say, he, make a, uh, him ineligible to be regarded as a founder of the age of reason. Um, the, there was a great uh, correspondence between, I think I mentioned it, between his acolyte Samuel Clark, a reverend, and his enemy Leibniz. Um, the difference was that uh, Leibniz thought that God had created the system of the world, meaning the solar system, and then left it to run by itself. And Newton thought God needed to keep it uh, ticking away properly. Uh, it's a debate that uh, I find amusing because even if you imagine that they were talking about something real, which I don't, um, how it was something about which neither Clark nor Leibniz could possibly have any knowledge. Um, well, that's the sort of thing that interested Newton. Um, on the other hand, you don't find this much in the Principia. The Principia is completely naturalistic. Um, it doesn't mention divine, I mean, the, the business about the stars shining because of the will of God, that's in a letter of Newton to Richard Bentham. It's not in the Principia. Uh, there, I don't think there's anything about the stability of the solar system in the Principia. The Principia is completely naturalistic. And on that ground, he was attacked. Uh, it was attacked in England, uh, both by a theologian at the University of Cambridge, John Hutchinson, and also by Bishop Jar George Barclay, after whom Berkeley, California, is named. And um, getting the vowels right. And um, uh, so, Newton was attacked after his death, uh, I'm not sure what he was after his death or not, uh, on the grounds of being, um, of having no room in his theory for God. That's, that's unfair to Newton. Uh, or from another point of view, too fair to Newton. Uh, he, he, his own thinking is very, very religious. But it was not unfair to Newtonianism. The, the Newtonian theory which survived to make up much of the Enlightenment. Uh, Trevor Roper said it was the success of Newton's theory that led to the end of burning of witches. Um, it was the naturalism of the Newtonian theory, whether or not Newton would agree with that, that really um, fit in so well with the Enlightenment. But Newton himself, no, he was not an Enlightenment. I just want to real quick, just to have a follow up on that, because you know, it's interesting, 
if we just did word count, I think Richard Dawkins would then no longer qualify as a scientist. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, I, I try to hold myself down. This is a fascinating approach to using the science report as the older of bringing together mathematics and natural science uh, has been very productive. I have read recently, and I want your opinion about this, I, I've read recently that mathematics has become so complex that people may take several of dealing with mathematicians working on different parts of our theory to present a scientific proposition. And the question, and, and so the, I'm thinking about a writer who describes everything <coughs> as is possible now to the enthusiastical machine thinker. Uh, it is possible now that science is no longer new science advances is no longer understandable by a person. Oh, I think that's terribly exaggerated. There are some famous theorems in mathematics, like the four-color theorem, which says that uh, if you want to have a, a map with arbitrarily shaped countries and color it in such a way that no two countries that border each other have the same color, you never need that theorem, uh, I mean, try it at home. It, it's a maddening thing because you think you found a map that requires five colors and then you realize, no, uh, it doesn't, it only requires four. Um, well, now let me come back to string theory. The, uh, uh, the four color theorem required computers to prove. Mm -hmm. it, and uh, I, it may have been a team of mathematicians. There are a few things like that. Um, fortunately, kind of physics I do, although it certainly uses mathematics, doesn't use anything real hard like that. Um, there, I think a disturbing thing that's happening within physics that Louise mentioned is that in what may be the most promising direction for speculation is this theory called string theory, which requires more mathematics than most physicists, including me, have. But it isn't that they have to work in groups. They simply have to be better educated than I was. Uh, I, uh, you know, I learned the mathematics that was necessary for the physics of my time. And um, uh, since then, I've learned some other mathematics as I needed to. String theory is a big, requires a big step forward into a branch of mathematics called algebraic geometry, which is real hard. I remember a colleague of mine once asked a member of the mathematics department, um, what would it take for me to learn algebraic geometry? And the mathematician said, oh, you couldn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Our mathematician, Mike Trevor. Oh, Mike here? Yeah, I, 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 in the back. Uh, Mike, you've been standing all this time? I have, I have, it's been delightful. Uh, <laughs> but I, I have a theory that human beings aren't that bright. <laughs> Just take small steps from from moment to moment. And I, my question was about Newton. Do you see him in that light? Certainly, in the case of calculus, which I know something about the history of, you can view his contribution as really incremental from what's happened before. Mm -hmm. The fact that Leibniz independently thought the ideas was another evidence of that fact. Uh, do you, Do you see that in in his other work? Was Was Newton taking small steps, or was there really Genius involved. Uh, Mike, in the meantime, what's the matter? Mm -hmm. no, uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm delighted that he wants to be able to make a picture. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as uh, calculus is concerned, there had been premonitions of calculus. Uh, 
Archimedes is calculating the areas of various things like circles and uh, the volumes of things like cones uh, used what was a primitive version of the integral calculus, as did Kepler in fig figuring out the volumes of wine casks, one of the things he devoted himself to uh, when he needed the money. Um, so uh, cap that sort of thing was in the air, and as you say, Leibniz also developed it. In fact, our modern notation in calculus is due to Leibniz, not to Newton. Um, in physics, I think uh, the idea of the inverse square law, as I said, was already in the air. I think the big thing was that you could put together the mathematics of infinitesimal, uh, if not quite the whole formalism of calculus, together with the inverse square law and some fundamental ideas of motion, and actually calculate what happens as a planet goes around the sun in a non-circular orbit. Just to have the intellectual courage to think that that was something that could be done, I think was the great jump forward. And I've often seen that in um, today's physics, that very often um, the crucial thing in a scientist's work is not so much the brilliance of it, or the sheer genius of it, but just the intellectual courage to go into an area that no one has thought you could make any progress in, and make progress in it. Um, well, it also may be the persistence, the idea that yeah. if you have the idea that you can, I, I'm always impressed, like, like I, I mean, I don't know physics, but, but special relativity, for example. If you just start with the premise that the speed of light is the same in any inertial frame, really just the Pythagorean theory.